My name is uh, John, and if you read in the bulletin, it's spelled J-U-A-N. It's always a long story, but basically my dad spelled my name wrong. So uh, my name was supposed to be French, it was supposed to be Jean Libot, because my father's Libot, but he spelled my name Spanish. So my name in Australia has now become John, which is by far easier to explain than Juan or Juan. Um, this morning is a uh, baptism by fire because, uh, you know, the horseman of pestilence has come upon us and uh, Nelson couldn't be here this morning to teach. So he's asked for me to um, start off by first just giving a short witness so you know a little bit about me and my Christian walk. And then I'm going to do a, a sermon, continue in worship, and I specifically wanted to talk about truth again, which has been a wonderful theme for the last three, four months I've been thinking through and been seeing as I've been coming to the church. And something God's laid in my heart. In fact, when uh, Nelson asked me to preach, I sort of asked him what do you want me to preach about, and he said I should pray about it, <laughs> which is a very spiritual thing to say. My brain doesn't work that way. I'm a very logical guy. Give me a verse I can preach, but don't ask me to preach about anything. But I think through God's providence, I've seen that I think it's a very important thing to talk about. This morning was such an encouragement because even the songs we sang, rich in scripture, rich in doctrine, just aligned so beautifully with what I am planning to talk about. And it was not predetermined or pre-planned by me. So um, to start off with, when I was young, I grew up in a nominal Christian home. So I come from South Africa. Most South Africans, when I was growing up anyway, claimed to be Christian. But I would say my family were Christian as far as they were not Satanists. You know, they didn't really believe or follow God or obey the Bible. We didn't really go to church. We just were Christian because we weren't something else. And, and as I grew up, I became a staunch atheist. I was anti-God, anti-Bible. And I thought Christians were just silly people who believed in fantasy. Um, I believed in evolution, science. I thought I was very smart. And ultimately, one day, I went to a church camp. And again, I didn't go because I believed in God or anyone in church. I just went with some friends. And I got out of the shower, and all of a sudden, I just had this overwhelming idea that everything is complex. Someone must have made everything that is. And I started reading lots of books, and eventually I studied and read through the Bible and came to the conclusion that the book of the Bible is the only one that makes any sense. And so we'll talk about what salvation is, but salvation is interesting. Um, I can certainly tell you I wasn't looking for God. I didn't choose God. I wanted nothing to do with God, and I was dead in my trespasses and sin. And God one day just changed my heart when I got out of the shower. So when the Bible talks about salvation being a miracle, I can certainly see that. It's nothing I did in myself to be saved. So that's a bit about me. The best thing about me is my wonderful wife. <laughs> my father was so glad when I brought her home. I think he thought I was gay. <laughs> and so she's a wonderful woman who has always encouraged me to grow in Christ. And I was fortunate enough that by the time I met her, I was a Christian. And she's a wonderful woman of faith, and she always drives me to be closer to God and live what I'm supposed to live. So before we start, let's pray, and then I'll open up scriptures, and then we'll look at what the Bible has to say. Our Father in heaven, I thank you that we have this time this morning to open your scriptures to read about who you are, to study about you, to be thankful that through your supernatural power Lord, we have the Bible, that you've decided not to be silent, but to explain to us who we are, why we are here, where are we going, that you have explained the universe to us, and that it all makes sense, Lord, that it all is congruent with reality, that you are not a fantasy, that you are a living God, pray this morning, Lord, that your word would shine through and that everything we talk about, everything that I say, will glorify you. That men would see that you are God and we are men. And that we need you and we can trust in you because you are with us. In your holy name, amen. 
Okay, so this morning's sermon is about the fight for the truth. And so this has been percolating in my mind for a while because when I grew up, there was this big discussion of science versus religion. But I have noticed in the last maybe five to eight years, the argument has changed. It's now gone from science versus fiction. So it's not a question anymore of God versus the Bible. It's now about reality versus fiction. So we've gone a step further. It's getting worse than it used to be before. And truly, as Romans says, men's minds are melting down. So when Todd Stanton came up the other night to talk about, you know, by truth, look into truth from the book of Proverbs, I think that's very important. You know, do what we follow make sense? Is our faith, our God, our worldview sensible? Because what's happening now is we live in a time of secularism. And secularism used to mean a separation of church and state, a very American idea. But now secularism means we separate God and the Bible from everything. You know, there's whole of life and then there's religion. And the reality is we can't do that. So my text for this morning is John 14, verse 6. And half the time we'll be spending, we'll be reading scripture. And I'll be reading from the Legacy Standard Bible, the LSB. LSB is the new upgraded version of the NASB. So turn to John 14, verse 5 and 6. Wonderful chapter in the Bible to read through and try and memorize. John 14, Jesus discusses his imminent death and explains the way to eternal life. He explains heaven, hell, Christ, Son, Father, Spirit, eternal life, Satan, biblical love, and the way to God. So it's a very powerful chapter in Scripture. In verse 4, Jesus talks about he's going to heaven and his Father is preparing all his rooms for those to come. And Thomas says to him, one of his disciples, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus makes a very exclusive claim. He's not the only way, but he's also the only life. And there is no other way but through Jesus to the Father or to eternal life. Turn to John 3, verse 1 to 21, and I want to read through Jesus' definition of salvation. Everyone knows this um, a bit of history. So Nicodemus, one of the teachers of Israel, one of the Sanhedrin, comes to Jesus at night and he wants to ask Jesus a question. And follow with me as we walk through it so you can get the context and the question answered. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come to God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which has been born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who has been born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, bear witness of what we have seen, and you do not accept our witness. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whatever believes will in him have eternal life. So 
verse 16. We always teach this in one to our kids in Sunday school. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been done by God. So interesting story. Nicodemus, who's a teacher of the law, understands the Old Testament really well, a smart man, goes to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus can do things no one else can do. Now, Nicodemus is not a fan of Jesus. You know, he's not a follower. He's a critic. He's a Pharisee. He doesn't like Jesus, but he realizes by looking at what this man does that unequivocally he can do things that no one else can do. He goes to him and he asks him a question because he comes to the conclusion only someone who is from God can do these things. So clearly Jesus must have some sort of connection. And he asked Jesus the question that all of us ask. How can I get eternal life? Which is a very interesting question. Assuming you know, that we all think we are not just going to turn into mud when we die. So he goes to Jesus and he says to Jesus, look what I have to do. And Jesus says, you have to be born again. Then he says this interesting story about can you be born again through your mother. It's not that he doesn't understand. He's not dumb. He doesn't ask that question because he's stupid. He's a smart man. He asked that question because his point is, it's impossible. You can't be born again by going through your mother. So he wasn't misunderstanding what Jesus was saying. He was just saying, it's impossible. And the interesting thing that Jesus does is Jesus doesn't say, are oh, you wrong? What does Jesus do? He says yes, and then he talks about the Holy Spirit, and then he gives him the gospel. So Jesus' point in this text was that to be saved, there's nothing you can do about it. You have to believe. You have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and only through him can you be saved. That's it. You know, can't earn it, can't work through it, can't be born through your mother again. There's nothing you can be do to be saved. Only God can do it. So even Jesus defines what salvation is, which is ultimately, it's a blessing and a gift from God. Now, Jesus is truth, God is truth. Numbers 23 verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will not do it? Or has he spoken and will it not be established? So God doesn't lie. That's a very important principle to take away from Scripture and our whole worldview. Scripture trumps all things because Scripture never lies. So I'm going to do something that I know lots of people find boring. I'm going to go to London's Baptist Confession of 1689. Now, I'm just mentioning chapter 9. It's a great chapter to read. If you have time, please read the London Baptist Confession. Why? Because apparently that's what our church believes. So if you want to believe the same thing our church believes, go and read it. It's a great read. It's very simple. It's beautifully written, and every single thing it's written in there is scripture-based. In fact, if you go back, it tells you everywhere in the Bible that these texts and thoughts come from. You can even now get it in modern English on the internet, so it makes it a bit easier to read. Now, I'm not going to spend time on this. It's a very busy slide. Um, suffice to say that people in the natural state are absolutely opposed to spiritual good and are dead in sin. In other words, as R.C. Sproul used to say, we are dead in our sin, so we are corpses. What can a corpse do? It can only stink. So there's nothing you can do to be saved. God has to do it for you. So, by all means, go and read Free Will. It's a great um, piece of literature to read. This is the slide I want to focus on. What is effectual calling? What is salvation? So that's the old speak for salvation is effectual calling. So just reading through that definition. In God's appointed and acceptable time, he is pleased to call effectually by his word and spirit 
those he predestined to life. He calls them out of the natural state of sin and death to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. He enlightens their minds spiritually and saving me to understand the things of God. He gives away their hearts of stone and gives them a heart of flesh. In other words, he takes away the death that's in them and he gives them eternal life. He renews their worlds and by his almighty power turns them to good and effectually draws them to Jesus Christ. Yet he does it in such a way that they come completely freely since they are made willing by his grace. Underneath there you'll see all the proof text. I'm not going to go for the proof text, but please go and read it. It comes from the Bible. It's very clear. How does God save us? By his word and by his spirit. You can't start without knowledge. We can only be condemned by what we see. If we look at the universe and everything around us, it's enough to send us to hell, but not enough to send us to heaven. So God uses his word and his spirit, and he, through his almighty power, has to make us alive again through Christ. And in the BCF, I want you to notice that it's all from him. In that definition, who's the one doing all the work? Him, he, him, him, he, he, God, 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 God. It's not us. It's not me. It's not I. Which is the mantra of our new world. Me, me, I, myself. I mean, I laughed the other day. There's even a me bank, <laughs> which I find is hilarious. So we're so in love with ourselves, we don't look to our creator. So the summary of those thoughts is that salvation is a miracle that only God can do. That, however, does not mean we have a blind faith or a thoughtless faith, or a dead faith. We have a faith that is fixed in objective reality. And so if that's the case, there must be irrevocable proof that there is a God, Jesus, and the Spirit. So I'm going to do something a bit fun. Let's go to this next slide. So approaching things from where I started as a non-Christian, the first question you always come to is beginnings. You know, where do we come from? You know, will we created or did we just evolve? So I'm going to ask my first question, which is what's the difference between a steak and a cow? It's a great question. So from a biological perspective, you know, from a taste perspective, a steak is usually a cooked cow. But what's the difference between a cow eating grass and a steak that's on your plate? And the answer to that is actually quite interesting. And the answer to that has to do with chimeric structure of proteins. And so all living things have L proteins. So if you look at the proteins that we have currently available, that we know of, they come in two isomers. Isomers means mirror images, like a left hand and a right hand. And so L isomers means the left-sided proteins, and R isomers mean the right-sided proteins. Now, interesting fact, and again, this is, they don't teach you in school because there's no scientific or evolutionary explanation for it, but all living things are made only of L proteins. That's weird if you think about that because if things just exploded and happened, how does just one side of protein form and then there's other proteins? Makes no sense. So the difference between a cow and a steak is as soon as you kill the cow, the protein changes. Cows become a mixture of L and R protein, and that is steak. But a living cow is made only of one kind of protein, which is L protein. It gets even weirder because DNA is not L sided, DNA is R sided. So the data that stores information is the opposite way around, and all DNA is R sided. And you go, well, how did that just happen? You know, one day, gas just wanted to be smart. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And then somehow this gas conglomerated and decided to not just form proteins, but L proteins and RDNA. It makes no sense. So, next question. Could things just have gotten here by itself, without drive or desire, just with ingredients and time? And I think the best explanation, again, is if you take the steak analogy. If you take a steak and you throw it in a vat of water, would you ever expect that steak to turn into a shark? I wouldn't, you know. And a steak has got lots of DNA, RNA cells, protein, etc. That's by far more than we started with apparently in the universe. 
And that would never, I would never be surprised. I mean, if you took a steak and throw it in your bathtub and you're walking there and see a shark, would you be surprised? I would be surprised. My mind would be blown. What, has, it, has that ever happened in the humanity? Ever? Never. But we say we start with nothing, with water, and somehow spontaneously sharks appear. And we go like, that seems logical. That makes no sense to me. Another one I find always funny is like, think about it like this. If you walk into your garage and you own a Fiat or a Volkswagen Polo, would you be surprised if you walked in the next day and it's turned into a Ferrari? I would be. I was like, who stole my car? I would not think, look at how my car spontaneously evolved overnight. It just wanted to be more. So even with lesser things, it makes no sense. So how come in greater things like humans and DNA and RNA, things which are so much more complex, we go like, oh, yeah, that just happened. That's intellectual suicide. So let's talk a little bit about protein. So an, a, a, an amino acid, which is basically a sequence of proteins, most proteins are about, you know, the shortest one is about 20 amino acids, but they can go up to about four to 600 amino acids. Things you have to know about proteins. Proteins are not worms. They don't lie in a straight line. Proteins are flexed in 3D space. So to get proteins long enough just to be alive, you just have one protein. I'm not talking about all the proteins that exist, just one protein. To be an L isomer, so just one mirror images to spontaneously happen, just out of the blue. It's about 10 to the exponent 164. You know, if you talk about the mathematical numbers of that, that's insane. I mean, that's more than all the atoms in the known universe. Almost twice as much for just that to happen. Then the other thing you have to understand about protein is because protein folds, if you have the same protein and you fold it differently, it does a completely different thing. So proteins are not straight lines. They have 3D structure, and the 3D structure determines their function. So you can have the same protein flex it three different ways, and it will do completely different things. And then it gets even weirder, because we used to think that how protein shape changes is it slowly changes from one shape to another. And the latest research shows it doesn't. It does this weird thing where it quantum leaps. So it just pops out of existence and changes how it looks instantaneously and then pops again and changes. How does that evolve? How does that just happen? So how likely is it that one living cell could have spontaneously evolved? And so Fred Hoyle and another mathematician worked this out a long time ago, sort of in the 1980s, and it's 10 to the exponent 40,000. And that's for one living cell. And we're not talking about multicellular organisms, humans, DNA, RNA, all these things which are by far, 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 far more complex. And so that's 500 times more likely than all the atoms in the known universe. So I don't think it makes sense to believe that mud wanted to be smart one day and here we are. So our faith when it comes to could we have evolved I think it's very unlikely. And those few facts I gave you, it's just a tiny bit of facts. There's by far, far more things you can talk about and so many more arguments about intelligent design. So if you start off with everything is complex and there's intelligent design, your next question would be, well, then it has to be then a designer. The sequence of creation. Let's quickly talk about that, Genesis 1. And this is one of the things that I loved so much about the Bible when I came to the Bible as a atheist and eventually became saved was that the Bible explains how the universe was made in a sensible, logical way. It starts with, with in the beginning. So the first thing God had to make is the beginning, which is time. God is outside of time. He's not inside of time, so he had to make time. So time and space. So it starts off with, with beginning because God has no beginning and he's outside of time. So the first thing he had to make was time. And then he separated light from darkness, and then an earth with water, and then land and dry sea. And then he made all things in a particular order, first grasses, then plants with seeds, and then fruit bearing trees. And then heavenly bodies in relationship to them. In other words, the heavens, the atmosphere, the ocean, 
and then he made land animals in specific sequence, fish, birds, modern land animals, livestock, and then eventually man. And the Bible is the only old text that explains that in that sequence. There's no other text that does that. Now, the chance of Moses guessing that sequence right, because we know Moses wrote the um, Torah in the book of Exodus, is about one in 500 million. So just guessing the sequence right, that's how unlikely it is that he guessed it right. So either Moses and the people before Moses had an understanding of how biology worked and science worked and knew that and wrote that down, which I think is unlikely, or he guessed right, which I think is unlikely, or it's by far more likely, Exodus 33 verse 11, that when he sat down with God face to face and he asked God, so who are you? Why are you here? How did you make everything that God said? Well, I started with X, Y, and Z. You wrote down what God said. So let's quickly turn to Exodus 3, verse 13 to 15. Everyone knows this. This is Moses in the burning bush. Verse 13. Moses said to God, Behold, I'm about to come to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they will say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abram, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name from generation to generation. So God's name is I Am. God is unapologetic in his existence. He doesn't ask for us to believe in him. He doesn't ask for us to acknowledge. He just says, I am. And Moses takes it at face value and goes on, and the rest of the Old Testament gets written. So when God is asked who he is, he says, I am which is a very interesting name, it's continuous. There was no beginning to God, there is no future, there's just always everywhere at the same time. Which again is consistent with what scripture teaches about God and what is consistent with how the universe must have formed. Men though, why do we care about this question? Why do we think about this question? Which is interesting, Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11 uh, Solomon writes about the purpose of life. Excellent book again if you want to go and study a book about the meaning of life. It says in Exodus, uh, sorry, in, in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, He has made everything beautiful in His time. He has also set eternity in their heart. Yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from beginning even to the end. So God has put in our sides, in our hearts, in our minds, this understanding that He's there. Romans 1, verse 18 to 23, this is the treatise from Paul where he talks about the same principle from Ecclesiastes, starting in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So men know in their hearts there's a God. They have to actively suppress the knowledge of God because... That which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, both His eternal power and divine nature, has been clearly seen. Just as like I was trying to point out to you. Just with a few simple facts. And all these new facts I'm talking about are things that's only been discovered in the last 15 to 20 years. It's not things that we knew about 2,000 years ago. And the more we discover and the more we learn, the more complex we find things are, the more we realize that there must be an intelligent designer. Being understood through which, for what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools." and exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the likeness of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So they love themselves, not God. So is there a God? 
I think as Christians we can be very confident that there is no other explanation for life, for the universe. I mean, I'm not a mathematician. I work with biology, and I think biology is one of the things that drove me to God. The more I learn about humans, the more I learn about disease, the more I learn that we are fearfully made. There's so much stuff we're discovering every day and things we don't even understand until it's discovered, and then we go, wow, look how that just evolved, which makes no sense to me. So the case for God, I think, is clear. We have a God the Father. And the qu next question is, was there ever a Jesus? Um, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on it, but excellent websites to go and look at. Um, the Cold Case Christianity is wonderful. It's done by a guy in the U.S. He used to be in the CIA. He used to capture all these uh, criminals. And he used to be an atheist, and he wrote a whole book about Jesus. You know, if you look at the evidence that's available does it stack up? Does it make sense? And I like the way he approaches it. Now, um, I don't like all his theology, but I think at least the extra biblical stuff he talks about is very worthwhile looking into and reading because it's a useful tool when you speak to people who don't believe in God. So, if you want to know if someone existed, you don't ask the groupies. You don't ask the followers. You start off by asking all the people who didn't care about Jesus. These nine authors there, um, all of them were hostile to Jesus. In other words, they didn't want to believe in him or follow him. They were just historians. They had no vested interest in mentioning Jesus or talking about Jesus. Now, there's about 40 extra biblical texts that quote Jesus, which is about four times more than Tiberius Caesar. So there's lots of evidence outside of the Bible that Jesus really existed. In fact, there used to be a statue made by one of the uh, widows to Jesus, which Nero burnt down when he burnt down the rest of Rome. Um, so there used to be a physical likeness of Jesus as well. I'm glad it doesn't exist anymore because I'm sure um, some church groups would have prayed to the statue. But let's talk through the hostile agents. So it's very interesting just to listen to what some of these authors who were non-Christian, non-biblical, extra-biblical authors said about Jesus. So Thales said Jesus lived, he was crucified. And when he was crucified, there was darkness and an earthquake. Remember that miracle that happened when Jesus died, the whole world went dark for three hours? Again, Thales is not a Christian. He's a Roman. So there was a Jesus, there was a crucifixion, there was darkness. Tacitus called the followers of Christ Christians, and he knew he was executed on a pilot. Um, Phlegon. He said that Jesus predicted the future, which he did. Jesus rose after his death, and he was crucified, and there were signs, darkness. So, Phlegon, who's not a Christian, attests to Jesus' resurrection. That's very important. Pliny the Younger um, said that his followers thought he was God. Jesus claimed to be God. Suetonius, Jesus was a real man who was called the Christ, and he caused the Jews a hard time, which is true. Celsus said that Jesus was allegedly born of a virgin, his father was a carpenter, and he had miraculous power. Josephus said Jesus was a wise man, and his followers reported resurrection. Talmud said that Jesus was executed the day before Passover and had magical power. Now, these guys are not Christians. These texts all exist. You can go and look them up on the website. And they claim that there was this man, Jesus, who had miraculous powers, who was resurrected, and his followers believed he was God. So is there a historical case for Jesus? Yes, I think there's lots of evidence, more evidence that Jesus existed than Tiberius Caesar. I like Sam Harris. He's a great atheist to listen to. So if you have time, go and listen to him. I like his flawed arguments. He gives you all these interesting things from a very atheistic view. And he's a deep thinker, talks a lot, but clearly has a profound misunderstanding of what Christianity is. And a profound misunderstanding of what Jesus claimed and the Bible actually says. I find that quite often. I find a lot of the people who have bad things to say about Christianity have never even read the Bible. You know, as evidenced by some of the stuff he says he thinks we believe, but it's clearly not true. 
So one of the things he does is he talks about Jesus and Christianity. He's anti-religion completely, but he has a nice little section about Jesus, and he talks about why you shouldn't believe in Jesus. And he talks about miracles, and then he, he quotes this guy, Satya Sai Baba, um, this amazing guy with this big afro in India who apparently could do all these miracles. So he had more than a million followers, and he could do miracles too. In fact, you can go on YouTube, and you can go and check his miracles, and you would be underwhelmed at his miracles. <laughs> I think they have a very loose definition of what a miracle is. <coughs> so some of his miracles are, he could materialize holy ash. So he does this thing where he takes a pot and he flips it over and ash falls out and just a lot more ash falls out that's inside the pot. Anyway, that's his miracle. I'm not sure what the purpose of the miracle was, but he can, he can make ash. He also could make small objects like rings, necklaces, and watches uh, appear. Sounds like a con artist. And apparently, he could do healings, resurrections, clairvoyance, by locations, like traveling in space and time, and was allegedly omnipotent and omniscient. <laughs> but he died. <laughs> um, multiple people have gone after him to prove that all the stuff he did was fakery. <clears throat> in Jesus' time, though, his miracles were undeniable. And Jesus' miracles were real ones. It's quite fascinating. If you look at the gift of healing, the gift of healing in the Bible is never used on Christians. The gift of healing was only ever used on non-believers. Why? Because the purpose of the gift of healing is not to heal people. The purpose of the gift of healing is to prove that Jesus is who he says he is. So this guy, Satya Sai Baba, apparently was also... Um, had a miraculous conception, but he's the fourth of five children, which I found hilarious. At least Jesus claims to be born of a virgin. He was the first. There was no father. So he was number four out of five. So I'm not sure how they define miraculous conception. But he dies on the 24th of April, 2011. There's a million people at his funeral. Um, and you know what? He's still dead. He didn't come back. And I think that's a very important thing to distinguish between Jesus and all these so-called other miracle workers. Jesus never cared so much about the miracles. In fact, if you look at John 2, verse 23 to 25, which is a very important piece of scripture to read, it says from John 2, 23 to 25, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. When they saw his signs, which he was doing. So the people believed in Jesus because of all his power. His gifts, what he could do was undeniable. You know, Jesus' miracles were real miracles. You know, grew arms back, healed people, raised people from the dead. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he had no need that anyone bear witness concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Jesus understood that miracles don't mean anything. Miracles do not save people. The whole of Israel saw miracles in the desert. They saw miracles in Israel, when, when Israel left Egypt. And did they follow God? No, they all died in the desert. Miracles do not save people. And Jesus knew that and understood that. The greatest miracle is not the miracles that Jesus did, but resurrection, forgiveness of sin, a transformed life. That is the point. So what biblical evidences then, if we look at extra biblical sources, what biblical evidences do we have of Jesus? Well, we have four Gospels. Gospels are written by eyewitnesses. Um, J. Mack has a great sermon called The Lie That Proves the Resurrection. If you ever have time, go and listen to that. It's an excellent sermon. Many people were martyred because they believed in the resurrection. I mean, would you really want to get killed for a lie? I certainly wouldn't. I think, you know, if you look at history and how many people died for the belief of Jesus' resurrection, I certainly wouldn't do that if I didn't believe it to be true. The Gospel of John talks about Jesus, and then John also wrote the book of Revelation. So when John wrote the book of John, he meant the physical, literal, real Jesus, whereas the book of Prophecy, the book of Revelation, John clearly understood the difference between prophecy and biography. We know that in John 20, verse 67, when 
When it got to the grave, the grave was empty. The stone was rolled away, which is impossible to do. The Roman soldiers all fleed. Um, they got in there, and the grave clothes were there. Now, all the Gospels account for the grave clothes. They really make a big deal out of the grave clothes because if someone stole the body, so if the disciples stole the body, what would they have done with the grave clothes? They would have took it with them. They wouldn't have left it there. There wasn't time to quietly roll the stone away, sneak in there and unroll all the grave clothes while all the soldiers were outside. They would have gotten caught. So they would have taken it with them. If robbers went in there, what would they have stolen? They would have stolen the grave clothes because of all the spices on it, which was very, very expensive, and left the corpse. If you were resurrected, then you sat up and you rolled them out and put them in the seat and then walked out, you would have left them there. So the grave clothes are really important. There's 11 times it's recorded that people saw Jesus after his resurrection. So he was seen by the disciples, men, women, groups, crowds. He was seen inside, outside. He walked through walls. He ate with them. They touched him. They spoke to him. And this was all done by people who thought he was dead. What did Thomas do? Everyone tells him, oh, Jesus was here. Where does he go? No way. I won't believe it until you show me the wounds. And then what happens? Jesus comes in, touches the wounds, and he goes like, now I believe. So he was a skeptic. He didn't believe Jesus would come back. Eventually he believed when he saw Jesus physically. After that, there was a massive hostility against the church. We all know the craziness of Nero and all the crazy things he did. And the church is still here. Jesus also predicted his own crucifixion, his burial, rising from death, and it all happened. Prior to that, there's centuries of prophecy in the Old Testament that points towards Jesus. So much so that in most of the synagogues nowadays, they don't read Isaiah 53 anymore. They skip that chapter completely because it's so clear that it's about Christ that they just don't cover it. In fact, one of my friends, who is a lovely Jewish guy, <laughs> read Isaiah 53, and then when he read it, he started to laugh because he sort of went like, I now understand why they don't read this chapter. It very clearly points towards Jesus Christ. So we have non-biblical authors that point to the historical accuracy of Jesus. We have the Bible that points to the accuracy of Jesus. And from a Sam Harris perspective, Jesus is very different than this guy. Jesus' miracles were real. People that didn't like Jesus and hated Jesus couldn't deny his miracles. But Jesus didn't care about the miracles. The miracles was pointless. Jesus was born of a virgin. This man clearly wasn't born of a virgin. And he died. Jesus came back and ascended and is still at the Father's right-hand side. Let's talk about the Holy Spirit. So how do we know there's a Holy Spirit? First of all, because we have Scripture. 2 Peter 1 verse 21. For no prophecy was ever made by the will of man, but men being moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Scripture comes from the Holy Spirit and from God. And I'm sure you all know this, but the more you study Scripture, the more you realize it's not a book written by men. There's nothing like the Bible. There's nothing with its accuracy, scientific accuracy, intelligence, simplicity, and power to change hearts and minds. In fact, last night I was doing some Bible study with my kids and just reading through Matthew 6, and just the insight Christ had into our hearts. The idols we love, the things we seek, what is important to us, to a T, gets it all right. Secondly, there was visible miracles after the resurrection. So when you turn to Acts 2, verse 1 to 4, it says, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues like fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages, as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So there was visible miracles in the times of Pentecost to show that what was happening was real. So not just internal, but external. 
Thirdly, the gifts in the church. So 1 Corinthians 12 is 4 to 11. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. And there are varieties of workings, but the same God who works everything and everyone. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what is profitable. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to other the word of knowledge according to the Spirit. And to someone else, faith by the same Spirit, and to other gifts of healing by one Spirit. And to another, the workings of miracles, and to another, prophecy, and to another, the distinguishing of spirits. To someone else, various kinds of tongues, and to others, the translation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing them to each one individually as he wills. So one of the reasons we know there's a Holy Spirit is when we look at the diversity we have in our church, and in all the churches I've been in my life, God has picked people there with gifts, with skill, with knowledge. He's empowered them to do amazing things for his kingdom. That doesn't come from themselves. Fourthly, fruit of the Spirit, which is a transformed life. Galatians 5 is 22 to 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. So these things that the Holy Spirit gives us is so contrary to the world we live in. Does the world seek love? They've got a very warped idea of love. Love is all very self-focused, not other-focused. Joy. For them, joy means fun, entertainment, not inner peace. The world is definitely not patient. It's not about kindness. It's not about being gentle, and certainly it's not about being in self-control. All these fruits of the Spirit is anti the world. The fruit of the Spirit comes from the Holy Spirit. And lastly, the church. The church is one of the best evidences there's a Holy Spirit. Because the church shows us, through its continued existence and growth, over 2,000 years there must be a God. If all we believed in was some false heresy, there would be no church. The church has survived persecutions from within other religious groups, from the Roman Catholics, from outside the church, from heresy inside the church, from sin, from the flesh, from Satan, and still here is the church. The church is the only institution God's promised to bless. We're here together because God wants us to be here. We're here because we want to be here. It's a place where there's joy and growth, a place where you can honor God. So in summary, we now live in a world that's post-truth. I'm in an interesting predicament often when I speak to people and because I work in a medical science and in the world and clearly what's happening is people are now embracing fantasy. And we can be confident what we believe is not fantasy. We have a reasonable faith. We have a real faith. We have a faith that aligns with the reality around us. If I look at things around me, things that I didn't make, but like, you know, if I look at my mobile phone, I never come to the conclusion that it spontaneously happened out of mud. I look at my mobile phone and I think, gee, Samsung did a great job. You know, it took them 40 years, lots of engineers, billions of dollars, and they made a nice phone. And that phone is nothing compared to the complexity of human beings and my dog and fish and cats, etc., etc. I mean, I look at things that are so much less and I come to the conclusion, man, I've made pretty good things. How can we look at the universe and come to the conclusion that this happened? That makes no sense. So our faith is reasonable. This is important because as we're going to go through persecution and our state legislation and government's going to change and things are going to change, I think it's fair that we call out reality. We have a reasonable faith. The knowledge of the beginning of the universe, the knowledge of where we start and where we go is important because it has eternal importance. In fact, one of the things to always think about is there is no evolutionary benefit to have a fear of death. Evolution is about the fittest should survive. You know, if we really are just smart mud, why would you be afraid of death? Because the worst thing that can happen to you is you would become mud. There's nothing particularly scary about turning into mud. 
the reality is we just know there's an eternity. We know that after death, there's an eternity for us, either good or bad, all to the glory of God, but there is an eternity. And that makes no evolutionary sense. Creatures that just evolve from mud and live by death would not fear death. Death would be a good thing because we can get better and smarter and faster. In fact, one of the biggest indictments to the theory of evolution is just hospitals. You know, if we truly believe in the evolution, why do we have hospitals? Why do we just you know, put sick people in a place to try and get them better? It makes no sense. So two weeks ago, Pastor Nelson gave us a summary of the gospel, which he wrote in the bulletins and went, went through. And I, I think it's important just to remember that when you share the gospel with unbelievers, you mention the whole gospel. The gospel has five points to it, really, which is there is a God creator, which you have to be intellectually crazy not to believe it. And I mean, I get lots of opportunity where I work to speak to atheists, and it does not take long to convince them that there is an intelligent design and there's a God. They don't like the idea of it, but if they're honest, they will admit it. The second thing is, if there is a God, he must be holy and just. And he has a standard, and we've broken that standard, so we have sinned. All of us have sinned. And sin is an interesting thing. I don't have to convince people about sin. They all know they've sinned. So you have to tell people of the hell, condemnation, and sin. And then comes Christ, who is the God-man, who is the only way to the Father, the way, the truth, and the life. And if you think about it, it's mind-boggling. No other religion can answer, how do you appease God? So in the Muslim faith, God is capricious. It's where said, you, our father is not capricious, but the Muslim God is. He decides random who goes to heaven and hell. Our God doesn't. Only God could pay the price for sin for God. So Jesus was necessary. Without Jesus, there can be no salvation. And then importantly, once you are saved, it's not merely to be saved. It's to live a life of obedience. That is the point. It's not simply just to say now that I have fire insurance, I can do whatever I want. It's to live a life to the honor of God. And so in, in my teaching there this morning, I didn't realize there was going to be a benediction, so I actually had a benediction. <laughs> but I read you my favorite verse. So my favorite verse in the Bible is Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13 to 14. And so Solomon says this at the end of his life. He's had everything he wanted. You know, he's had all the intelligence, all the books, all the money, most powerful army in the world, all the princesses you can imagine. In fact, he had a thousand of them. And his conclusion is this. The end of the matter, all that has been heard at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes is fear God and keep his commandments because this is the end of the matter of all mankind. For God will bring every work to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. I'll finish in a word of prayer and then Noel can come up for the last song. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we could have studied your scriptures this morning. We thank you, Lord, that our faith is not blind. Our faith is reasonable. Our faith makes sense because you are a real God. You are consistent with reality. You are consistent with what we see around ourselves. And the more we as men and scientists discover, the more we are astounded at the complexity and the intelligence of who you are. In fact, Lord, we have to suppress the truth to turn away from you. We have to actively switch our brains off. We have to actively decide not to even think of you when we look at the universe. We pray, Father, in the world that we are in, help us as this church to share your gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit to transform lost people around us and that we will live a life consistent with who you are. We pray this in your holy name and throughout this week, Lord, help us to witness to those around us in our occupations, at home, that we will live consistent with your word. Amen.